the sudden change in temperature causes thermal stress on the hull, making it much more easy to fracture. An iceberg is seen, but it is far too close to avoid. The iceberg damages seven compartments. The Titanic slides over the shelf and damages her bottom plates just aft of amidships. The iceberg breaks apart. Small chunks of ice are drawn towards the starboard propeller and she loses a blade. This creates a strong vibration, which gives the immediate impression that the engines are suddenly going full speed astern, when in reality they are not. The watertight doors are closed. The engines stop, thermal stress had weakened the hull, and the impact causes the outer plates underneath to buckle. Some of the survivors are told the Titanic has broken her back. She has a double bottom, so she is not in immediate danger of breaking apart, at least for now, the forward compartments are flooding, the ship settles down slightly by the bow. The bow is narrow and tapered, and contains mostly narrow corridors, mail bags, and cargo, the water rises up quickly to the waterline, as there is less space to fill, as the bow is narrow and tapered, it has less effect on the trim and angle of the ship, compared to the main body of the liner, which has far greater effect. The sea that immerses into the ship simply drives the air out, which reduces the buoyant effect. The water does not add physical weight, it merely reduces the buoyant force, which is preventing the Titanic from going down. Thermal stress weakens the hull and creates a slight bending effect. The passengers notice, some of the cabin doors are jammed as the hull begins to bend. The gradual loss of buoyancy in the forward compartments gradually increases the bending effect which increases the buckle underneath. Survivors in the first lifeboats notice the ship is hogged back, as the bending effect increases. As the forward compartments begin to lose buoyancy, the bow settles down to deck, e. She lists to starboard, which creates a twisting effect on the hull, and increases the fracture just aft of amidships, but still not enough to cause immediate concern underneath the main engine room. The watertight doors, behind the damaged compartments, are reopened to allow the pumps to be carried through, the water in boiler room 6, is continually pumped out, and Chief Officer Bell, reassures J. Bruce Ismay that these pumps, will keep the ship afloat long enough for help to arrive. Steam is vented out of the ship, but the wireless operators cannot hear, owing to the extreme noise, the captain gives orders to have this abated, the sound stops, the remaining steam builds up, inside the ship, and will later explode out with terrific force during the breakup. The water now washes along the corridor on the starboard side. It washes down the main stairway leading to the Turkish baths and swimming pool, on deck, F. Mr. Wheat immediately closes the manual watertight door which prevents the swimming pool from flooding, the Turkish bath section floods, the water rises back up to deck, E, and continues to move aft, the water level inside boiler room 6, gradually goes down, water from deck, E, very slowly spills down into boiler room 6, and is slow enough for the pumps inside the boiler room to handle, the ship settles lower, there are many open portholes on the port side, the rooms on the port side start to flood, in a domino fashion, which causes the ship to settle back, and list over to port. The survivors notice, the Titanic is sinking at a much greater rate, the open portholes, produce far greater flooding, compared to the initial iceberg damage, which seems minor in comparison. The list to port gradually increases, as more cabins begin to flood, the bow contains narrow corridors, they flood quickly, and many of the adjacent rooms become partial air pockets, which take much longer to flood. As a result, the bow remains partially buoyant, and the progression of the downward tilt begins to subside, owing to the volume of trapped air, and many cabin lights remain on, below the waterline. The survivors notice the port list is much more noticeable than the downward tilt, survivors further aft also notice passageways are starting to flood, as the open portholes further aft begin to go under, and allows the ship to settle more bodily. As the bow rolls to port, the stern tags behind, owing to the weight of the main engines, and the slight delay, increases the twisting effect on the hull amidships, and further increases the damage underneath. The water makes its way to the main third-class dining room amidships, which increases the sagging effect of the hull, and the center of the ship sags down to a greater extent. The damage to the double bottom begins to increase as the ship bends and sags, the port list causes deck C and D to dip below the waterline, the open portholes on those decks causes the port list to increase, 
the water does not spill into the boiler rooms because the boiler room doors were elevated, and the water simply bypasses the doors and moves further aft. The pumps control the flooding in boiler room 6. As the water level goes down, the water in the corridor, above, slowly spills into boiler room 6. The pumps continue to control the flooding, and the bow remains in the same position, for a very, long time, as the water on that deck was slowly flooding into boiler room 6, which was being pumped, what they did not realize is that the overwhelming number of open portholes amidships and aft were causing far greater flooding all over the ship, as the open portholes caused her entire port side to settle lower and lower. The port side cabins were flooding, and the water still had not flooded into the remaining boiler rooms. The Titanic was becoming increasingly top-heavy. Survivors noticed two lines of portholes below the waterline that are still fully lit, indicating that at least two decks below the waterline are not flooded. Survivors down on deck E still notice very little water along the main corridor, as the water had primarily moved into the port side cabins, as the port list steadily increased, which reduced the level of water in the main corridor and delayed the flooding of the boiler rooms. The increasing list to port caused her starboard side and propeller to rise up. The strong list to port may have a direct effect on the watertight doors and cause them to jam. Regardless, the vast number of open portholes caused the ship to settle bodily, in an attempt to keep the lights burning for as long as possible, orders are given to start another engine. Thermal stress on the hull increases, and the center of the ship sags down to a greater extent. Her stern is now slowly bending and buckling upwards. As the ship became more top-heavy, the movement of the passengers on the boat deck began to have a direct effect on the stability of the ship, the officers ordered all passengers to the starboard side to keep the ship balanced, as she was now dangerously top-heavy. The ship rolls from port to starboard, several times, and the survivors witness the entire ship rocking, this movement increases the fracture underneath the ship, especially as her stern section which contained the main engine room would not roll as freely as the forward section. This tugging and twisting movement further increases the breach underneath the ship to the point that her side plating begins to buckle open and coal from her bunkers begins to pour out. Meanwhile the fracture underneath is steadily increasing and starting to expand up the ship's sides. Coal continues to leak out of the ship from underneath, the crew attempt to close the upper watertight bulkhead doors further aft, but without success. The water can now move freely throughout the entire ship, a bulkhead is heard giving way, and a roar of water is seen rushing into boiler room 5, the water inside boiler room 6 rapidly filters out and into boiler room 5, the water along the corridor recedes back down the corridor and into boiler room 6. Survivors witness very little water on the corridor, boiler room 4 was also damaged by the iceberg, and the gradual bending of the hull had increased the breach, which accelerated the flooding. Survivors witness the entire ship settle down bodily, broadside. As the ship slowly buckles and twists apart, the electric lights in the forward half begin to dim and glow red, the aft section remains bright and stands out in the memory of many survivors. The upper decks of the bow now drop below the waterline, they act as an access point for the water to enter, but these decks do not flood, because the water that enters from the top will first travel through the corridors, down the stairways, across more corridors, and when every available space below has been flooded, the water will rise up and ultimately flood the upper decks. Owing to the heavy list to port, the passengers try to push collapsible boat A uphill to the davits, the starboard side is still quite high above the waterline, and the crew prepare to fasten the boat, in preparation for lowering, the sound of metal breaking is heard, and the passengers can now feel the boat deck is beginning to shake and tremble. A roar is heard as the water rushes into the upper decks amidships, the water washes down the stairways and finally into the boiler rooms. Huge volumes of air inside the boiler rooms are pushed out of the funnels which cause tremendous amounts of smoke, some of the boilers are still hot and sparks are seen rushing out, the fracture increases, and the boilers, in boiler room 2, implode, the shockwave, can be felt, as the ship trembles, and continues to twist and break apart. The sea is rushing into the breached decks, with such intensity, that it is snapping, her wooden decks, and making it harder for the ship to stay intact, the bow and stern now begin to twist apart in opposite directions, the bow settles lower and the sea rushes into the remaining open portholes and windows along her promenade deck, 
as the sea rushes in with intense velocity, it causes the air deep inside to burst the water upwards to the boat deck. The passengers on the boat deck continue to hear the sounds of the ship breaking apart and feel the ship tremble. They look over the side and witness the water rushing into the promenade deck below them. They turn to see that water from inside the ship is now bursting up to the boat deck by the rapid expulsion of air. The sea bursts out of the doors on the boat deck and swept many people off the deck. The ship continues to break apart, and the rapid flooding, entering the back of the bow, causes the port list to quickly subside, and the bow rolls one more time to starboard. The bow has almost completely detached, and the bow tugs forward as the sea rushing in, creates momentum in the bow, and pushes it forwards, and further increases the separation, steam pipes burst open, and the sound of steam escaping is heard. The bow lights begin to extinguish, the first screams and sounds of panic aboard are heard during the moment of the breakup, as the bow detaches and lurches into the sea, sweeping many people into the water, while at the same time, the stern rolls violently over to port, throwing hundreds overboard and into the sea, an enormous roar of people screaming are heard. The bow is almost independent from the stern and takes a sudden lurch into the sea, the bow quickly regains buoyancy as it begins to act independently. As the bow lights extinguish, it appears to some in the lifeboats that the bow has disappeared and gone down, while many others can still clearly see it afloat, as the bow and stern are now separated. The remaining air keeps the bow above the surface, and the survivors observe the Titanic floating in two separate parts, which gradually drift apart. The forward passageways are narrow, they rapidly flood, and turn the adjacent cabins into partial air pockets, which temporarily assist in keeping the bow buoyant. The pivoting motion and rapid flooding of the back of the bow causes the second funnel to be lifted off its base, it falls over to starboard, creates a wave and sweeps many people forwards and onto the well deck, and many people are drawn towards the gaping hole, which leads down to the boilers below, they flood quickly, and the velocity of water, rushing in, creates a whirlpool effect. The lower decks contain a great amount of air. The sea rushes into the breached decks and pushes the air forwards. The water also comes in from above, which contains the air deep below, and drives it further forwards into the forward end of the ship. All of the remaining air and buoyancy is rapidly being pushed forwards into the forward end, which quickly rises up. The water that was previously in the forward end now rushes downhill towards the back and allows the prow of the forward end to briefly pivot up above the water, to the point that the survivors in the closest lifeboats can see the bow pivoting up as both ends of the ship rise up simultaneously. Immediately after the collision, Mr. Bewley heard the air trying to escape out of a hatchway cover, it was secured by an iron bar and he witnessed the iron bar bending by the pressure of air trying to escape, imagine what kind of effect the enormous volume of escaping air had on the bow, as all of the air from the back of the bow now pushes rapidly into the forward end. The results are dramatic and witnessed by survivors in the closest lifeboats and those still aboard the ship. The bow remains afloat because it still contains buoyant force, similar to a World War II military DD tank. DD tanks were able to float by the attachment of canvas sheets, which were raised up to increase buoyancy above the tank, which was below the waterline, a propeller was attached, and the DD tanks were propelled across the water. The survivors in the lifeboats witnessed the bow lurch down, and then bob back up, to a very noticeable degree. As the back of the bow rapidly goes down, the air deep inside, is pushed forwards and into the forward end, making it more buoyant than the back and the escape of so much air, and rapid transference of air, from the back to the front, and rapid transference of water, rolling from the front to the back, was sufficient enough to bring the forward end above the water, for a brief period. Wreckage from the bow and stern, spill out, and land on the sea floor together, the boilers inside boiler room 2, do not fall out, because the angle was not great enough to push them out of their seatings. Second officer Lightoller feels the bow as it breaks away and lurches into the sea, owing to the rapid instability of her structure. Lightoller feels the water rushing into the forward ventilators and is pulled towards them. As the water rapidly rushes down into the boilers and breached bulkhead walls, he then feels an enormous volume of air bursting out, which pushes him back to the surface. The water continues to rush in and draws Lightoller back down, and again, more air is released, which pushes him back to the surface. 
The bow is not, full of water, as evident by the sheer volume of air, that bursts out, through the forward hatch covers and ventilators. Almost all of the air has finally escaped out of the bow, and the broken bow section, now dives into the sea completely. The first funnel falls over to starboard, and pushes collapsible boat B, far away. The remaining air bursts out of the bow, and it sinks down, the stern continues to buckle upwards, and it is still fully lit, her lights shine brighter than before, owing to the fact that the engines now only have to supply the stern section with electricity, there is sufficient reserve to keep the lights burning. The steam rising from the water, mixed with the cold temperatures in the air, creates a glare effect, and her stern stands out, as if it is on fire. Large plumes of heavy black smoke rise up as the bow section goes down. Some of the survivors are startled by the sound of the breakup, they turn in their seats and look at the ship, and when the smoke clears, they see the stern sticking up, still lighted, and they mistakenly believe the Titanic is still intact. The stern section is being held in that position by the weight of the main engines. She slowly corkscrews around, and just as she turns, the survivors hear a second explosive sound, the stern is breaking apart, the forward engine cylinders break away, tearing the stern apart, the third funnel falls down, the aft end of the stern settles back, with a strong list to port, the noise of escaping steam, finally stops, the lights finally extinguish, the fourth funnel falls back and over to port, the stern is now facing the opposite way, and she gently glides down quietly into the sea, and the Titanic finally comes to rest on the seafloor.